interested to see me, then welcome to you too. All of the other sessions have been recorded, so you can go back and you can watch those. So this is the power of video discussions. And my name is Mark White. I'm the Director of Instructional um, Institutional Technology and Design at the College of St. Mary. Um, We've been on Canvas for five years. I work as the chief Canvas administrator. I work with faculty development and instructional design. And so we try to integrate Canvas into our face-to-face, -face, our hybrid and our online courses. I'm also an instructor within the doctoral education program at CSM. So I'm in a fairly unique role in that I truly get to see all sides of Canvas. Um, I've been in education for 25 plus years. Um, I was previously a fifth and sixth grade elementary teacher. Um, then I moved up into higher education. I've headed centers for teaching excellence. I headed up the online consortium with 70,000 students and seven community colleges across the state of Iowa. Um, so I've been immersed in this online environment for quite some time. I actually taught my very first online course in 1999. So old old experience coming on here. So today what I want to talk to you about is what I am learning and uncovering about video discussions. Because you see, threaded discussions are very common in online courses. But in my experience, many of them just aren't done well. Students don't like them. And faculty often seem to miss the point of why they're having a discussion in the very first place. So with that in mind, Let's talk about discussions. And so what I mean about discussions, like I wanted to put a definition around what I consider a powerful discussion. And to me, powerful discussions are things that engage students or, or us for long periods of time. They depend on knowledge. They depend on research. They depend on your opinions and they depend on your clarity of expression. And they also demonstrate what level of comprehension the speaker has on the topic. So discussions, that's to me what I'm, that's, that's the ideal discussion. And while we're talking about ideals, in the ideal world, when our students are with us face to face, they would talk long and often about these topics. They would, you know, get into the class prepared with all of the information on the topic and would be willing to listen to each other and share their understandings and, and everybody would be involved. Because you know, a powerful discussion reinforces the learning. And by having students assimilate what they know and put this into their own words, it concretes that learning. The, the discussions just provide great ways for reflection, investigating new ideas, responding with facts and analysis, and you know you can go right up the scale of Bloom's taxonomy. So based on my years of experience in online and specifically the last three years collecting data on discussions within the same course that I've taught three years in a row, um, I think we can get pretty close to this ideal powerful discussion. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. If you've got questions, throw them up into the chat and I will do my best to keep an eye on those and respond. Um, otherwise, just jump in with your own audio and, and, um, and let me know um, what your question is or your comment. Hopefully there'll be some time at the end that we can have some discussion further. So an online discussion. Let's start with a bold statement. Online discussions have advantages that simply cannot be beaten in a face-to-face -face class. So let me say this again. An online discussion is far superior to any face-to-face -face discussion within certain situations. I believe they are so much better than a face-to-face -face class discussion that if you taught a face-to-face -face class instruct um, course, I would still highly recommend that you use online discussions. Let me explain why I believe this to be the case. Unlike online, unlike face-to-face -face, um, classrooms, online discussions allow time to think about the topic deeper and for longer. This is not a, I heard the topic once and now you immediately want me to tell you what I think about it. I can go review the facts 
find out additional information before I give you my answer. An online discussion also makes sure that absolutely everybody in the classroom participates. And as an instructor, I can see or hear their efforts and their level of participation. You can't do that face to face. And online discussions also, unlike face to face, don't reward the quickest response. They reward the best answer. So in a face-to-face -face class, what typically happens is the teacher asks a question and one student throws up their hand or four students throw up their hand, the faculty member picks on one of those hands raised and says, what do you think? And the person says their answer and the faculty member pats themselves on the back because if that person answered correctly, I must be doing a good job. What we don't know is about the other students who did not raise their hand, who might still even be thinking about the question, yeah, let alone even come up with an answer. So we miss them. Likewise, just because you're the fastest answer doesn't mean you're the best answer. And so online gives us the opportunity to level that playing field. It also has one more advantage. This is what you see in face-to-face -face classes all K-20. Students engage, they're talking, and the instructor is over on the left-hand side and he's thinking, ah, oh, Listen to all this learning, right? That's what you want. The question is, is the noise that you hear in your face-to-face -face class actual learning or is it just noise? Because you can't hear all of those people and what they're saying at the same time. In the online discussion, you can tell the difference for every single student. So with video discussions, I mean, so here, so, Online discussions still don't quite get to that level. You know, there's something about human connection. There's something about seeing somebody and reading their emotions and listening to the inflection in their voice um, that conveys a lot when you're having a discussion. Just reading text, that may not come across. Sarcasm, innuendos, you, those are more difficult to figure out. And you know, you can get into problems with somebody who's misinterpreted what you've written. So video helps us create, correct some of those um, issues with written discussions. So here's what I've discovered. The video discussions are more engaging than the written discussions. They are more honest. You can't fake looking at the camera and telling um, the camera what it is you think about this thing. You can't plagiarize it. You can't copy and paste somebody else's answer and stick it in there. And because of that, you've got better assessment opportunities. You can really get an, a sense of whether or not the individual posting shows that they understand this concept fully. Additionally, it's easier for students to do than to type a mini APA paper in their threaded discussion. It's more enjoyable for them to do. It fits more with their nature. Like, I like to talk, so this is what we do. And it's better focused on authentic objectives. You know, that's what we always talk about in terms of authentic assessment. They should be assessed on what they're trying to do. It's very difficult to have a debate where you're writing the debate. That's not really authentic. We typically don't do debates in written format. So why assess that? Have them do that with the video. So here's what I'm calling my video conversation process. So this is a screenshot from the course. Um, I have blurred out the images of the students um, to protect the innocent and the guilty. Um, but the first thing you should notice is I changed the word from discussion to conversation. And that's just because I feel like discussions have this bad connotation around them. So when you hear the word discussion, you're immediately thinking, oh my God, one posting and then two replies and it's due Sunday night. And that is not what we're trying to achieve here. We want an ongoing dialogue, an ongoing conversation. And so this is the process that I went through um, with my students last year and more so in this year's um, course. The first thing is key. It's an, having an open-ended prompt. 
there is a horrible cycle of violence in online <laughs> threaded discussions. Here's how it goes. Faculty failed to put a great initial prompt together. Okay, it's kind of closed. It's a case study and says, tell me what you think about this, All right? That then leads students not to really have anything to discuss. Because once you put your answer out there, then that's really the end of the discussion, okay? Especially since some of these students don't have the knowledge or the expertise to expand or, or, or flip the conversation in new directions because they're learning it, right? So they then don't do a great job with responding. So then the faculty member goes, well, I'll fix them. I'll require that you do two responses. So now the students go, well, crap, now I got to do two responses. I still don't really have anything to discuss. So I end up with answers like, I really liked what Jordan said there about blah, 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 blah. And I think that is applicable to this situation. That's not a good response. That's a, that's a minimum effort just to meet the requirement. And that's not what we're looking for. So faculty got smart to that and then they were like, okay, so I know what to do. I'm gonna institute a minimum number of words, right? <sighs> All of this compounds and makes a really unfulfilling experience, right? The other thing that it goes into is that you then end up having to create these really elaborate grading rubrics that is gonna to try to force and encourage discussion. Okay, stop the madness, it's a discussion. When you are in your classroom, you don't tell the students they can only respond to two other people in their group. You certainly don't say, oh, and by the way, you have to give a response that's 300 words. Otherwise it won't count as a response. There's no thinking like that. It is perfectly acceptable for you to say, John, that was brilliant. I love that idea. That's okay. You're continuing the conversation. So, <laughs> My requirements, they just had to post and respond. I didn't tell them how many, and I didn't tell them for how long. Now, I will admit, I used a rubric, um, but the rubric I used, I really needed to adjust because it was written for written discussions and the online ones or the video discussions, um, it needed to be tweaked for those. Um, but also the discussions and the conversations that occurred with video were actually so good that the rubric became a mute point. Okay, so there was a rubric, I'm not proud of it. It is pretty streamlined, so it's not horrible, but it could still be, there's work there. There was no minimum length. I didn't tell them their post had to be one minute or 30 seconds or five minutes. I let the conversation flow. As an instructor, I made postings deliberately at random times. I didn't want them to assume that I was going to start the conversation. I didn't want to hijack conversations. I jumped in there to help. That also enabled them to realize that, oh, the instructor does actually listen to what we're talking about here. So I was intentional about where I posted my videos. And then the discussions ended on Monday morning at nine o'clock. Why did they end on Monday at nine o'clock? because that's when I was going to grade them. They did not end Sunday night at midnight because I wasn't going to grade them after that. So why would I deny the students the ability to work from midnight until nine o'clock in the morning if they so needed to? So midnight on Sunday was not a thing in my class. It was nine o'clock Monday morning because that's when I would be able to have the time to sit down to actually start reviewing it. That helped my students immensely because I had students that were on different sets of work shifts. And so for some of them, working at one o'clock in the morning was perfect for them. And at others, they were going to bed at nine o'clock in the evening, so they submitted their assignment prior to when they went to bed. And for yet others, they might have worked on something Sunday night until 11 o'clock and just been like, okay, yeah, uh, this is, I'm getting confused, I need to sleep. They slept, set their alarm for early in the morning, woke up fresh and had another crack at it and got their submission in for nine in the morning. So that's the Monday morning um, spiel. The creation process. Um, and this first part is vital because last year when I did this, the technology was not seamless and there was more work to get the videos to work correctly. This year, it seemed 
like everything was so smooth that the technology just faded into the background. And that's really what you want. So what the students simply did was we use VidGrid um, and within VidGrid, there is an integration within Canvas and it's called VidGrid Embed. And so in the old rich content editor that you see on the screen, VidGrid Embed with this nice blue button. Students would just simply go to the thread discussion, press reply, and then press the blue VidGrid button. The um, recorder would open up on their computer. They would then select webcam only. They would then just record their statement. They had the ability to play it back to see if they were happy with it. And then they would just press the check mark to say upload it and put it into the discussion. And then the final thing they did was simply post the reply. Boom, that was all they did. There was no go into YouTube, downloading links, having to learn how to embed links, um, go into Google Drive, having to download movie files to then watch the movie files. It's all placed straight within Canvas. That was super important. There were some initial worries by students, like, oh, I don't wanna do this because it was foreign to them, right? Um, I will tell you that the videos that they did, the video conversations they did at the beginning, um, they were more put together. <laughs> um, people worried about their appearance a little bit more at the very beginning. And then by the end, it was like, no, I'm just talking to you, right? Um, but in those preparations, they spent a lot of time thinking about what they wanted to say, really writing down notes as to what other people had said. And consequently, they were learning and being tricked into learning more or thinking more about the topic than they would have otherwise. So here's the data that I found. So um, in this course this year, there were five video discussions or conversations. They were open for one week and I have just five students in the course. The total average length of weekly postings, so when I add up everybody's video postings, was three hours and 15 minutes. So a lot of video was produced each week. The average for each individual post was just over four minutes. And the number of postings that individuals did was nearly 10 a week. So this whole make one post and then do two replies, we blew through that. They were all doing at least 10 responses every week. And then the total number of postings by the whole group was 55, nearly 56 postings per discussion. Here's the stat that really got my attention and made me think more about it. When you looked at a person's initial post and then you followed the thread as to what they then did or how many people responded to that post, on average, students received at least 45 minutes of undivided attention from their group. I mean, I mean, let that sink in. I make a post and make a statement. There is, a, there is nearly an hour of, a, of, of videos that are completely tied to what I started. That just doesn't happen in a face-to-face -face class. Nobody gets that much attention. And certainly, not being able to do that for everybody. But with the online, that was truly possible and powerful. When I look back over the three years that um, I taught this course, the first year I taught it three years ago, it was only written discussions. Last year um, was a mix of written and video, but it was mainly written. This year, only the very first post was written and the rest were videos. So when I look at this year's, the number of posts from the very first posting, which you would have thought students on their very first posting would have put all their effort into, was 47. The video average from the remaining postings was 55. So there was an immediate increase in the number of postings. When I look at last year's course, the average number of written postings was nearly 44. So far below 55. And here's the other thing. There were two more students in the course than this year. When I look at the same course two years ago, and that just had one more than, than I had this year, um, those average numbers 
were just 30 posts. So the number of posts dramatically increased with the use of videos. What we found was the quality and the quantity of engagement increased. Um, and some of that subjective, so I put that in my humble opinion, but those things increased. The enjoyment levels increased from the students and that came back from student feedback. So they enjoyed it. So consequently, if you enjoy something, you're more apt to go do it and you don't dredge it and you put a better effort into it. So that's an important element. Some additional findings. This was interesting. So being able to look at VidGrid, you're able to look at the video and see exactly who watched the video. And you can also see how much of the video they watched. This was a piece that I never really considered before, um, or not very well. In my written threaded discussions, I would have no idea if anybody read the entire thread or if they just read the post that they responded to, right? Where with the video, I was able to see that student A watched all of the videos or didn't watch all the videos or watched part of the videos. And then looking at that data combined with what type of response they gave was kind of insightful. One of the things that came back um, from the students was we have a couple of students that were from the South and so they talked a little slower. And so their Northern um, <laughs> classmates would times 1.5 or 2.0 the speed of the video so that they would talk faster for him. Um, I don't know about the ethics of that, but it was certainly a, um, it certainly um, helped them um, in listening to it. So that was, that was interesting. But it was also really clever to be able to see who was able to post something that was so captivating that you had all of these other posts that went along with it and how long those other posts were and then you could kind of gauge the enthusiasm or, or, or the debates that were going on within those videos. So I got a lot more information about how my students were working with each other versus the standard, I liked what you said, and here's one more thing that I'm gonna to add to the conversation. So here is the, you know, the best example is what the students tell you. So here's, here's what the, the student, um, this was, I got lots of feedback from the students from very scared at the very beginning, constantly throughout. Um, and this is one that kind of typified the overall experience for my students this year. And it was that the use of the video discussion boards as a tool encouraged the students in the class to interact in a more organic and meaningful way. That, that, that resonated with me. That was one of my goals. I believe it was one of the most useful tools. Well, that's just me patting myself on the back on that one. But I'm thankful for the discourse and the ability to connect with my peers in this way. And that was an element that I had kind of thought of, but, but it really came through that by having the videos and being able to look into each other's eyes and each other's home environment to some extent, the students were feeling better connected with each other. And you know, that's what it's all about in terms of learning and especially with online learning. So some concluding thoughts. Um, I need to do more research on this. You know, I only have done it over the last three years, same course. Um, there may be some questions about sample size, but I stand by the research because even though the class size was only around six people, that's all I would probably recommend anybody have in a threaded discussion. So if you have a class of 30, I would still recommend only having a discussion group of like six people. I mean, think about it. You got a class of 30, 14 people have posted. What is the 15th person possibly going to add to the conversation that hasn't been said in some manner? Or you do the, you can't see anybody's posts until you post your own then you get 30 responses that are all very similar. So again, that kind of cuts it off. So I would recommend small groups, six being probably the largest. So in which case, my information and my data shouldn't make any difference whether I had 30 of them or whether I had six of them. There's probably a stats person out there who can tell me how that's wrong, um, but I'm going with that and, and we'll look to see how this, this progresses. It was fun because we're in a YouTube um, generation. 
Um, but the students I had were graduate students um, and they, they ranged in age from old um, teachers to young teachers. And so they all got on board with this. But I think the environment is such, and certainly COVID has been one that people are much more comfortable sitting in front of a computer and sitting in front of a webcam and talking to it. Um, this was more difficult a year ago. It was really tied to my course objectives. I wanted students to engage in the topic, discuss, gather, and share what they had learned. And this really forced them to do that. It was great because I got additional information um, and further insights. And it provided this feeling of togetherness in an online environment that I hadn't been able to achieve before. Now, could I argue that, well, that just happens to be this group? Possibly. Um, when I teach this course again next summer, I will see how it goes with them. But I certainly believe that, it, that what I did for the objectives that I needed, it beats the one post and two responses by Sunday night at midnight, which were really just kind of mini APA papers, even with citations in them, you know? So my courses, they were referencing something another person would say, well, where did you get that reference from? And so then they would come back and tell them, this is where I got the reference from. So it enabled them to act like academics and not just be worrying about how my APA citation should be written. And so that was, <laughs> that was what I needed. Thank you so much for your time. We've only got, um, oh, we've, still, we've got three minutes. So we've can, we can look at some questions. Um, the question is, do you need, do students need creator accounts in VidGrid to allow postings? Um, do those accounts get, do the videos get tied to instructors VidGrid account? Okay, so two things. Um, if you wanna use VidGrid embed, then yes, you have to have um, students have creator accounts. So I would say talk to your VidGrid person about that. Um, if they're in VidGrid embed, then the faculty member just goes to SpeedGrader and just looks at the discussion and you see the videos. So you don't have to worry about a fold or anything like that. Um, if you don't have creator accounts, you could still, you could still have students submit videos. Um, you gotta do a bit of a workaround and I could talk to you offline about that, but basically it would be, um, you create a, um, a student um, record um, using the external tool and put a link at the top of the discussion. That then gives them the link to create the video. And then you would have to teach them how to take that video in, um, and place it into their discussion. So it's a bit more complicated. That's what we had to do a year ago, um, but it's certainly possible. Um, how do you handle closed captions and transcriptions for the student's video? Yes, closed captioning is a function and we have it turned on automatically with VidGrid. It machine captions everything um, and it is pretty accurate. We do tell students or I did tell the students, hey, you might want to go in and make sure that your um, transcription isn't saying something completely erroneous. Um, but yes, that was that was doing it. Um, wouldn't studio be a better option in Canvas? I, I'd have to know more about um, studio. I don't know what you mean by that. I will tell you that the insert media button within Canvas is absolutely horrible. <laughs> so I would not use that. Um, and the reason for that is um, it's nice and convenient and it is on the um, RCE. However, when you click upload, you have no idea how much has uploaded. There's no progression bar. And so, com and it also takes a very long time to upload videos on a very fast network, we were finding it takes five minutes per one minute of video. And students just weren't waiting that long. And so they'd close their laptop and it would never get in there. So that was awkward. So unless they start updating that media tool, I wouldn't recommend using it. Um, is VidGrid an application in, in Canvas? No, VidGrid is a separate company, but you can, if you you know, if your institution can make an agreement with VidGrid and purchase it for your, your, your institution, that can then be um, integrated into your instance so that that works. There is another company out there called Loom um, that has a very similar interface to VidGrid. Um, Loom currently will allow you to do this video type of recordings, 
um, and it's free for instructors with a pro license. So that's another one to kind of consider. But um, yeah, the video with VidGrid is a separate company, separate licensing type of thing. Um, yeah. I feel like I rent at 4,000 miles. Hopefully you were able to <laughs> get a little sense of, of what we have been doing and what I've been learning about videos and, and video conversations. And hopefully it helps to reframe and give you some new perspectives on how you can utilize video conversations. I think this would be excellent with my fifth graders. I think my fifth graders would absolutely chomp at the bit to be able to post some type of, you know, I could, having a debate, you know, fifth grade, Revolutionary War, you're the Brits, you're the Americans, get in there and start acting like them and tell me why one side likes the other and what they're doing wrong. I mean, you could really do some interesting things um, with that. And, you know, students love to see them themselves on a web page and parents also love to see those types of projects. So I think it could be utilized K-12 very easily. Um, it's just the level of support that you would need as you go down through those grades. Thank you so much. Um, oh, Studio um, Instructors Portal. Yeah, very. if you've got access to Studio, you could do the very similar thing because they've got it embedded within Canvas as well. Um, I don't know if I would say it's a better option than Vigrid. Um, but Studio is also a newer product than VidGrid, so it's got a lot of um, growing to do, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, they but they've got instructors' money um, behind it, so they will catch up pretty quickly. Um, sorry, I yeah. Now that you say that, I I know what you're talking about. Yeah, um, but it's an alternative. Again, the the what tool you use is not so important. It's having something that's in, integrated in a seamless manner. That's the important piece.